that I think is important. The integration narrative, the civil rights narrative is important, but I do think there's been a, a systemic silencing of this other story. And that's the Malcolm X story. That's the black nationalist story. That's the pan-Africanist story. Um, so I do think that's why I've been so interested in recovering it because it's not the stuff you see in the curriculum. It's not the stuff you see, you know, that people talk about. And when they do talk about it, they seem to have a misconception about it. Malcolm X hated white people. No, that's not true, right? Um, when he died, he believed in the redemption of white people. He didn't believe they were inherently evil. And were, you know what I mean? And, and the stuff that he got when he was in the Nation of Islam. On today's episode, I will be talking to Professor Seth Marco about African decolonization as well as hip-hop culture and youth identity formation in Africa. Seth Marco is an associate professor of history and international studies at Trinity College in Hartford, Connecticut. He joined Trinity's Department of History and International Studies program in 2009. He earned his BA with honors from Tufts University in African Studies and English in 2000. In 2011, he received his PhD in history from New York University. He is the author of a brilliant book called A Motorcycle on Hell Run, Tanzania, Black Power and the Uncertain Future of Pan-Africanism, 1964 to 1974. Professor Marco serves as the Director of International Studies, a member of the Faculty Advisory Board in Human Rights Studies, and the Faculty Advisor to Trinity College Annual International Hip Hop Festival. Professor Marco teaches his students the multi-layered dimension of African agency and Africa's historical contribution to the modern world. I am so happy to welcome Professor Marco on this show. Dr. Seth Marco, uh, welcome to the Pan-African Experience. Thank you for having me. You know, prior to recording this uh, episode, I introduced you, and when I was introducing you, I mentioned your research interest. And I was curious to know what inspired you to go into this area of studies, like African studies, and then subsequently your PhD in history. Oh, well, sure, yeah. Um, well, first, you know, I just want to thank you so much for inviting me to your uh, show. I uh, feel really honored to, uh, be able to be part of a global discussion, uh, you know, about Pan-Africanism uh, in various different ways. Uh, I think for me, I, I got into Pan-Africanism, or I was interested, or I was introduced to the concept and term um, probably my early teens when I read uh, the autobiography of Malcolm X. Uh, those last few chapters, after he goes on his pilgrimage, travels to various countries in Africa like Nigeria, Ghana, Tanzania, Egypt. Um, and then starts to really uh, convey this message of Pan-Africanism, this fight against neocolonialism, imperialism. As a, I would say, 12 or 13 year old, those were complex, you know, concepts in a way, but the very basics of this idea around black unity, needing to unite, um, all those things for me really resonated being an African-American in the United States, dealing with racism and just trying to kind of figure out how to live in the U.S. as a racial minority. And I kind of gravitated to that autobiography and gravitated to these concepts where by the time, you know, I went to college for undergrad, you know, I majored in, in uh, Africana studies, well, created my own major in Africana studies um, and English literature with a focus on sort of global black literature um, and just got really immersed in that. And, you know, I think for a lot of people who become professors, uh, the undergraduate experience is a big experience as far as exposure to new ideas as well as mentorship. So I kind of got a combination of that black scholars mentoring me and then being exposed to, you know, an Africana studies curriculum where you're reading everything from Du Bois to Nguyen Watiango. Uh, and uh, in undergrad, I ended up writing an undergraduate thesis on African Americans in Ghana after, based on my study abroad experience at the University of Legon, uh, I met a lot of African Americans who were living there in the late 90s. Thought it was really fascinating that they kind of returned back to um, you know Africa. I had studied return movements, African American uh, return movements, and really just started to interview them. But then ended up writing a uh, you know a few chapters on the early 60s during Nkrumah and the African Americans going over there, like Du Bois and Julian Mayfield and Vicki Garvin and others, uh, and uh, ended up writing undergraduate thesis. And it was around that time of writing an undergraduate thesis where the idea of being an intellectual started to be an option. I wouldn't say I was 
wanted to be a professor, but I was definitely interested in this idea of research, writing, teaching, and exploring this idea around Pan-Africanism, African-American, African-Caribbean relations. Uh, and it was, you know, during my undergraduate, doing, doing my thesis, where I found out I really got interested in Walter Rodney. Um, he was a really big early intellectual mentor of me, and I found out he went to Tanzania. And uh, being in a graduate program, a very competitive graduate program, and you have to find that topic that hasn't really been researched about. I knew that Ghana was being written about by historians and others, the Ghana moment with uh, during the Kruma and African Americans going over there, but no one had written about Tanzania. So I like found my topic and really wanted to explore not only Rodney, but then in researching Rodney and following that thread, I found out about Malcolm X and Angela Davis and Stokely and um, you know how Tanzania became this revolutionary center um, between 1964 and 74. And that's where my first book uh, ended up being, you know, about Pan-Africanism and uh, the Tanzania moment. So it is this sort of long journey. I think one thing I forgot was that I was also a student activist. So when you're in Africana studies, getting these ideas, getting these ideas around race, liberation struggle, student movements, um, the people that I was with, we were trying to implement that stuff as far as dealing with the issues as minority students at the university, doing uh, uh, really uh, prison justice work in the city of Boston. So we were, you know, taking Pan-Africanism ideas and trying to apply them in the youth organizing work that we were doing at the time. Uh, and there was this question when I graduated from college, I didn't go directly into grad school, I went into activism work. And one of the questions that kept bugging me um, was I really wanted to know more about the history of, you know, African, African diaspora, liberation struggles. And that's what really motivated me to go into grad school because I knew that I would have the time to just read and then being a professor just, you know, was the outcome. So combination of this intellectual interest, but then kind of activist work in experimenting with and looking at history as lessons um, and looking at history, liberation, struggle, Pan-African struggle as lessons. Um, and we ended up doing a lot of Pan-African work. Uh, we worked with organizations in Kenya um, uh, during the years I was an undergrad and afterwards. So we were really trying to see what Pan-Africanism looks like uh, for my generation. Um, okay. So I know I said a lot there, but yeah, that's yeah. Like, I think that yeah. captures the salient features of my journey. Yeah. You know, I was born in Nigeria. I, I grew up in Nigeria. I came to the UK as an adult, like, you know, most of my peers for higher education. But while I was in Nigeria, I the concept of decolonization, African decolonization was not something that is within my, you know, uh, grasp. You know, it was not in my curriculum. In primary school, it was not in the curriculum. In secondary school, even in the university. So until I came to the UK, I started to become uh, aware of it, started to become interested in it. And uh, so I was wondering if you can uh, give a brief background on uh, African decolonization, that concept of African decolonization, please. Yeah, you know, I think there's a couple ways to look at it. Um, I think from an historian's point of view, you know, we look at errors and we try to, you know, uh, cut off times and put them in these understandable sort of temporal uh, moments. And uh, when you look at it from just a, a timeline perspective, we see African dollarization, African decolonization as something that's kind of taking place in the aftermath of World War II, um, when you're seeing this emergence of, of um, you know, African pro-democracy, anti-colonial movements, that sort of first wave uh, that we see. Uh, and so it really covers 1945 um, all the way up to the end of apartheid. Um, but that's just one phase of it, one stage of decolonization. You have uh, schools of thought that will say that the decolonization movement is still continuing, uh, even though Africa has achieved nation statehood, you still have issues of economic decolonization cultural decolonization. Uh, and so people have kind of stretched the way we think about that concept. Decolonizing can uh, 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 not, doesn't just mean uh, the achieving of national independence. Uh, and so uh, if you look at sort of uh, Africa right now in the 21st century, they are in a sort of late decolonization stage uh, where you're talking about the emergence of pro-democracy movements being led by a youth, younger generation, uh, really trying to, again, um, uh, challenge some of the legacies of colonialism, which is another key aspect of decolonization. How do we look at 
the colonial imprint on African societies, uh, post-colonial African societies, politically uh, from the institutions, um, culturally, language, other uh, behavior and practices embedded in the culture over time, uh, and blended and mixed, um, and then economically, right? Uh, and I think, which is uh, economically, I think it's the big question now, um, even though that was raised in the 60s by um, a whole bunch of uh, African uh, decolonizations, is that it's still uh, one of the primary targets we're thinking about a decolonized Africa. So it's the complete dismantling of colonial institutions, ideas, um, practices um, that have engulfed Africa since, um, you know, uh, European powers took over uh, in the late 18th century, 19th century. Okay, so you mentioned that, that almost like we are in the late decolonization stage, right? Uh, because I was thinking, you know, most uh, social movement struggles like... Uh, you know, the civil rights movement or the feminism movement or the gay rights movement usually come in phases. So prior to speaking to you now, I was thinking, oh, was the phase of African decolonization in the 50s to 70s, and that's it. You know, so that's why it was quite interesting to me that you said this is the late stage, but I don't think it's as active as, as it was then in those days you were, you were talking about. Yeah, I, I, I agree, you know. Um... And I think that's intentional in a lot of ways where people will think that movement building somehow goes away. Um, movement building, I think, is constant. Movement building on Africa is constant. I think the challenges on the continent, which has been uh, there since the 80s. So the way I look at it is that that anti-colonial nationalist phase, the 40s and 50s, the emergence of the founding fathers of the nation and Nkrumahs, the Mumbas, Mandela's, Krumas, you know what I mean? Yeah. Dore, everybody that we know, some who might still be in power or their political party still in power, yeah. right? That's one of the challenges where people are being like, you know, these old political parties who ushered their respective countries into independence have held on to power and people are now problematizing that. Zimbabwe with what happened there. And you see these emergences of people, of grassroots people mobilizing against these institutions in a pro-democracy way. The 80s and 90s and 2000s though have witnessed the backlash from the state. It's violent, it's harsh, and it really puts the onus on people in terms of what they're willing to do. Um, and then also the press, and the press isn't seeing it. They're shutting down media, social media, once these movements happen. So a lot of people outside of either an African country or the continent itself don't really know what's going on um, because of these backlash against, uh, because of censorship. But then also this, this uh, wave we're seeing of backlash against African journalists, right? Trying to report on this stuff who have been silenced, whether that's having to go into exile or actually being killed. Like these things are actually happening, um, which is making it hard for people outside to say, oh, there's nothing happening in Africa. But there is rumblings, right? Uh, the Lucha movement in the Congo, right? Um, even the Yenanmar movement in Senegal as an interesting model. Uh, there are younger youth movements in Africa that are coming together in a coalition regional based way. Um, they've been converging for the last two or three years, you know, in Senegal uh, to try to talk about a continental based platform, a very continental pan-Africanism uh, to use the old school phrase, you know, but it's, it's exciting time, I think, for African pro-democracy, nonviolent movements, you know, uh, as opposed to what we've been seeing. Um, but I don't want to leave this audience with the impression that's nothing happening. There's always mobilization, and there is something unique about this moment as far as mobilization because of these sort of things that sprung up, you know, not only starting with the uh, Arab Spring, North Africa, yeah. but then Zimbabwe, you know, then Sudan, uh, the Bobby Wine movement there in Uganda, all of these are all interconnected, I think, and, and, and is showing us that we're seeing something different on the horizon. Yeah, I know, I know through your teaching, you're someone that tried to change the perception of Africa or the way Africa is being perceived, you know. And, uh, you know, I believe in that as well. I tried to change the way Africa is being perceived, but sometimes it could be very difficult to do that when you see what's happening, you know, in most African countries, especially my country, uh, Nigeria. We had the NSAS, NSAS protests, yeah. you know, and right. uh, a lot of people were shot, you know, blatantly. Yeah. And uh, so if we are trying to encourage activism in Nigeria, this is the only fear because, you know, activism in, in America or in the UK is different because police, you know, there's shootings in America, but 
police will not shoot you just for protesting. You know, there has right. to be some form of escalation. But it, yeah. when you encourage people to do some form of activism in African countries, it usually mm -hmm. results in violence. So that demoralizes people like me, people like my peers right. that's trying to, you know, get people, you know, fired up, so, so to speak, to start to right. ask questions, you know, about the government. And then, it, so that becomes difficult. So how can you, yeah. how can you encourage someone to engage? Well, I think, I think one of the, the challenges for this age that we're in and the ways that we've seen protests happen is that we've seen protests happen really in the form of one tactical formation, and that's the, the mass march. We're going to try to get critical mass, go out into public spaces and try to raise our voice and then try to get media attention, not only like from, but like global media attention. Right, and people are going to rally around that. That's essentially the model we've been working with. It seems like in the last five, or what people see as the only model of what protest is. The only thing I would say to people is that there are many forms of protest, you know, and it's not just the civil disobedience, get out in the streets, and in spaces that where that proposes danger, especially um, where you're talking about violence being meted out by the state then, you know, there are other ways, you know, I think there are other ways to think about where, where whatever role that you're playing, whether you're a doctor or a lawyer or an intellectual or a janitor, uh, you know what I mean? Like of ways to try to think about ways of unionizing collective work, training, you know, uh, these things aren't necessarily um, attractive and appealing, especially the younger generation. But the key thing about movement building is training and process and experience like movements don't actually results don't happen in a year results don't happen in two years there have been people in america on the front lines doing activism work since before black lives matter and in some ways they've been overshadowed by black lives matter because black lives matter is out in the streets getting all the press and people think that's the only movement happening and it's not true right so it's one it's getting over this mental block of trying to accept that there are other forms of activism that aren't so glamorous that are about kind of grinding it out. <laughs> okay. You're kind of, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. and there's ways, and, but I do think there's this other, for me, and I try not to also get overwhelmed by the big picture. The big yeah. picture can be overwhelming. How do we talk about government change, you know, in a place like Nigeria, oil, all these big questions with a lot of forces at play, both internally and externally. These are big questions, um, but what, Soothes me as an intellectual, as far as the work that I do, is one, I try to think locally. Where am I at now? And what's the sort of local work that I can do? Um, and I also try to think about ways that we can think about an international, national, and global inter interconnection, right? Um, and so um, it's important not to get lost in the romanticism of activism is, I think, an important point. And that, doesn't, that might not give you a practical solution other than it's long, it's arduous, it's tiresome. And that's what true movement building is. That's what, even if we look back at the decolonization movements, you know, and look at, you know, that these were, you know, 1945, it took them 12, 13 years for either them to get independence by the gun or by negotiation. Sometimes longer, we see the ones that are armed revolution taking 30, 40 years. Yeah. So I think for us, time is different. And the way we think about time, we think about instant gratification, maybe that's through technology, but that still doesn't translate to movement building in a, if you really wanna talking about radical social change. At least that's what I've learned from studying past movements, liberation movements in Africa. You know, um, We don't have to rely on those old models. Oh, you don't have to be a Marxist ideologue. You don't have to be you know, versed in capital to try to understand the ways you're exploited as a worker in today's economy, you know what I mean? I think we've moved past um, these, you know, 60s, 70s models in a lot of ways. Some of them I think you can learn from, but I think we've moved beyond this thing of like trying to be ideologically accurate um, uh, and or getting into this thing around capitalism or socialism. You know what I mean? I think those debates have exhausted themselves and we're looking for something different. Uh, we're looking for something more humane um, working for something in between. Uh, that's the kind of conversations I've been a part with Africans um, who are trying to engage in social movement building, um, not trying to do too much, trying to connect with other people in Africa, especially, 
um, outside of the country in a, in a truly continental or regional Pan-African way, um, but also trying to do it from a grassroots people's perspective. Um, one of the things I do in my first book and I was interested in exploring was this was the first opportunity, you know, African people have been struggling against white supremacy and all these things for, you know, a long time. Uh, what we see after 1945 is this moment where for the first time, nation state power is into play, right? Ethiopia is an example, but you know, nobody was really working with Ethiopia like that. Liberia was essentially a colony of the United States. So here was an opportunity where African Americans, Caribbean people and Africans could engage with state power. Caribbeans had state power, African states had state power, African Americans didn't, but this was an opportunity where they brought in the people's grassroots. We're gonna work with state institutions, even though we're not representing the US state. And we're going to see the possibilities of working with state government. And they found out it didn't work. <laughs> and the people's pan-Africanism part is the part that works. It's the mobilization of the people, self-government, um, thinking about alternative modes of collective governments and decision-making. These were the things that seemed to be the powerful um, foundations to pan-Africanism from a people's mobilizing perspective. I'm sorry, man. I've talked about so many different things. No, no, <laughs> it's, it's, this, it's, I love, I love it's talking okay. about this stuff. Yeah, it's, yeah. It's okay. but I, just, I just don't want people to get over-romanticized about what activism is. Yeah. It's not just going to the streets, you know. That's yeah. not, that's just part of it. Yeah, you mentioned uh, other forms of mobilization, you know, mobilization. Can you elaborate on that? You know, obviously we have the, you know, we can do the protests on the streets. And we can do unionization, you know, maybe the workers, you know, can form a union and, you know, try to exert some form of influence. And then can you elaborate on that, other forms that we can uh, be able to, you know, express? You know, I, I th yeah, I think I can give you one example, which I think is important, which is the convergence model. And again, I'm taking this from the last chapter of my book on you know, Pan-Africanism in Tanzania. The last chapter is about the Sixth Pan-African Congress um, held in Dar es Salaam, 1974, uh, primarily organized by African-American activists, bringing uh, African state representatives, government representatives, representatives from African liberation movements, as well as um, Caribbean governments, um, and um, a delegation from the United States of African-American activists. Now, the interesting thing about the convergence, which made it so important, is this notion of dialogue, exchange, and common agenda setting. Um, because we live in a globalized world, uh, you'll find that, and I'm borrowing from Malcolm X uh, here, uh, the Mississippi is in the Congo. Uh, situations facing Black people in America, like in the South, things around infrastructure, water, um, environmental hazards, being in places of environmental hazard, you know, cry, you know, that's toxic places is where they're living. Th these are same situations happening in Africa. You know, yes, there are differences, but these are core similarities that speak to a common problem. And if Africans and Caribbeans and uh, African Americans, Black people of the world who believe in a Pan-Africanism agenda, don't realize this common sort of set of problems and don't have a chance to talk about them, then you know you're going to find a lot of uh, factionalism, fractured movements. Um, this was my critiques of the Black uh, uh, BLM movement. They don't have an international agenda that is significant. They don't have a platform for connecting with Africans. Um, it's a purely domestic agenda. Um, so we have to look at convergence as a, a really activist, proactive way to not only understand common problems, but coming up with a common agenda for people to move to their places and work locally. So I would recommend one of that. Uh, there have been examples. Um, World Social Forum is a big activist gathering of all these organizations throughout the world, including Africa. Uh, it was uh, Nairobi hosted the World Social Forum in 2007. Uh, yet what people found was that Africans uh, and Africans organizations and voices were silenced. Uh, it was another example of Western institutions, except it was coming from the left, Western organizations, leftist organizations from Europe and the global North coming in being like, Hey, how do I solve your, we have uh, solutions for your problems, right? And it wasn't a, a dialogue of equality. 
Same thing happened to African Americans at the Sixth Pan African Congress. Because they didn't represent state power, they didn't have the same sort of uh, clout with African governments who are like, how do we, you know, uh, operate in this new post-cold uh, colonial Cold War world. So what I'm saying is, you know, yes, these international gatherings seem to take place, but there needs to be a re revisitation around Pan-Africanism, a global Pan-African agenda. It's bringing in the Black um, and African uh, people understanding and talking about a common agenda and common goals, because the problem uh, in, the, in the sources and the roots of these problems are the same. Um, and, and you're seeing this backlash uh, against uh, uh, Black people. Uh, Africans are especially are now seeing it more and more with this forced out migrations to the different places of how you're treated in the Western world. And, you know, uh, I don't, you know, this yeah. question of a, a common platform around unity can't really take place unless we don't have these type of discussions. Yeah. Uh, so I think the conversion model is important, um, but at the same time too, I don't want to sit there and speak on behalf of Africans as someone coming from the diaspora, you know what I mean? Um, I do, you know, I don't want to come off like that uh, because I don't know, these problems are huge. You know, I teach courses on human rights in Africa uh, and understanding, particularly around uh, resource wars. So we go to, we look at oil in Nigeria and look at Ken Sarawiwa and what he was doing in the 90s and what happened to him, right? Uh, we look at um, the tree movement uh, in Kenya. Uh, um, uh, we look at um, Congo and Colton. And, you know, once you leave that and understanding some of these contemporary issues, especially around resource exploitation, and especially around new forms of neocolonialism coming from global South countries like China, India, and other places, you're talking about a whole set of new layers. So I think an understanding of the complex nature of that problem hasn't really happened yet, you know. Yeah, yeah, I think, you know, African leaders, I understand the, the external influences. I understand the, you know, some of the post-colonial pacts, you know, some of the post-colonial agreements. And uh, But I think if African leaders in general, if they put in more effort in terms of governance, you know, because, you know, most of African countries, we don't have a social net. You know, there's no, like, social security like you have in America or here we have, like, a benefit system, universal credit. Sure. We don't have that in Nigeria. You know, you are on your own. You know, if you can't feed yourself, you're on. But yet, people strive. You know, people manage to find a way to, you know, live. So yeah. all they need is just a little bit of uh, good governance, and I believe you know things will change. But yeah, um, <laughs> yeah, I think it's a shame. You know, when you're looking at these pro-democracy movements, the only thing that you know when you're looking at what people are asking, it's basic social services, basic respect. You know what I mean? And that's it. And and yet the violent response from the government is just not even listening to that type of those type of desires or needs. It, yeah, it makes it really it's so it's so basic what people are calling for um, and, and to have and to have to go to the streets and and, you know, do sit ins and marches and, and, and risk going to jail and even being hurt or killed just for basic social services. It's tough. It's tough to swallow. It's tough to see from afar. And from the people that I know on the continent, it's tough to sort of, you know. Yeah, my, my goal for this podcast is at some point, because I believe uh, in the power of information, you know, I believe, uh, you know, knowledge is power, as they say. Yeah. And hopefully at some point to, to do a lot of seminars in Nigeria, in African countries, primary school, secondary school, like I told you about Pan-Africanism. Yeah. I wasn't aware of it at a young age. Can you imagine if, you know, most people in primary school, you know, learn about these things, learn about Pan-Africanism, not just slavery, right. you know, even I, right. have, I have some uh, issue with um, Black History Month when mm -hmm. everything that you see is slavery and slavery and slavery. You know, I want to see more about Pan-Africanism. I want to see more about, I want to hear more about, uh, you know, Black radicals that were yeah. pushing Pan-Africanism. You know, children need to hear about those stories, not just like to relieve the uh, post-traumatic disorder, you know, PTSD yeah. from generation to generation, yeah. you know, whether they witness slavery or not, watching those movies, you know, seeing those stories again, seeing those images again is almost like a psychological uh, regress. So yeah. I would like to see more uh, optimistic, <laughs> you know, Pan-Africanism yeah, aspect. Yeah, I, I understand. Yeah, me too. You know, I have, you know, uh, you know issues with the way that uh, Black History Month has been, you know, commodified. It's been capitalized, you know, um, uh, capitalized on to the extreme. You know, I know, you know, 
Black History Month, and I'm, and I'm saying this with tongue in cheek, but Black History Month is like payday for black intellectuals, you know, uh, getting paid big time dollars to give a 45 minute lecture on Martin Luther King or something. You know what I mean? Like these <laughs> things are happening, but it, but it de-radicalizes the initial idea of what Black History Month was about. Um, it was about saying that there is this history there. It's a global history. It needs to be recognized. Um, but sometimes that can get, you know, turned into something that wasn't what it was supposed to be, uh, unfortunately. But uh, also to speak to the other point about, yes, this what you're doing now is also a contribution to movement building. If you see it that way, by talking about Pan-Africanism and having dialogue with people across various platforms from representing various different perspectives um, who are part of this Pan-African world, if you will. Um, you know, I I'm not so interested, you know, uh, I think I was traumatized in grad school uh, when I was taking courses on, you know, the transatlantic slave trade, you know. Um, what's been documented I think is far worse than what's been what we're seeing on television <laughs> through these various movies and shows however I don't run to watch them uh, I've read about it I've done research on it for a really long time and it was very traumatizing then to rewatch it again is traumatizing but I also think uh, that story needs to be told um, and it's and I also understand that this may not be for me uh, but it may be for other people but we also need to diversify um, you know, we need to diversify the stories that we're telling. Um, and we need to diversify the mediums in which those stories are being told. Um, I'm really into podcasting, you know, not only in the inter interview base that we're doing, but the storytelling podcasting. Uh, and there's so many stories in Africa. Wow, that's, that's, that will fit a podcast model, a storytelling model, yeah. and I imagine. So I, I would love to see that, you know, where you're building infrastructure and institutions. Um, a podcasting institutions on a global way and getting into this network because, you know, um, uh, so rich um, and all it needs is, and, and Africa has the technology, you don't need a lot, but if you have a cell phone, which most Africans do, <laughs> all the way from, you know, the slum to the village, people got cell phones and it got a recording, you know what I mean? It all starts there. Um, mm -hmm. And so I'm really into getting people's stories being told. I'm really now into public history and memory. I work with people in Tanzania who are actually doing historical preservation, uh, an organization called Afroots that does uh, ecotourism, but also um, animal preservation, but also historical preservation. Uh, the Tanzanian government until this organization uh, didn't do anything, but until this organization started to locate sites uh, to highlight the African liberation movement. This is where the ANC office was in Dar es Salaam. This is where Che Guevara came to Dar es Salaam to write his um, uh, diary entries about the Congo. And we started finding these locations and then giving tours because people come to Tanzania for the beaches, for the animals, but also for the its history. Uh, uh, during the 1960s, Ujamaa, socialism, Malcolm X, you know, liberation, all this stuff. And so we started to locate these places and started to give tours. And now the Tanzanian government has started to respond, put in money behind the African Liberation Center uh, mm -hmm. to, to commemorate that moment. But historical preservation is part of the struggle too, right? So again, trying to get off these less glamorous things, but understanding that there are so many angles and places that you can come in to contribute to the positive development of Africa, <laughs> to put it simply, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> positive development of Africa. Yeah, I agree. I agree uh, about what you said with regards to podcasting. You know, this platform is uh, information dissemination now is decentralized. You know, obviously we have the bigger platforms where you have to put this information, but to an extent, information dissemination is decentralized. Where you know, in Nigeria, right. someone can have a podcast on their phone. Someone can film what's going on and put it on uh, YouTube or, right. you know, and so information gets out quicker than before, which is a good thing. I hope, you know, I hope uh, this will accelerate to bring a change. I wanted to, yeah. I wanted to say something about, um, you know, Pan-Africanism. It would be good to see like, uh, you know, more, maybe more Americans or more black people in diaspora in the UK or ar around Europe to start coming back to Africa to engage with Africans. You know, I think Ghana, maybe a year or two, had like the homecoming event. I yeah. don't know, you were aware yeah, of that? Did. Yes, I was, yeah, very much so. That yeah. was really, really good. And uh, this comedian, uh, Hannibal Barros, I saw on a podcast saying, oh, he went to Ghana and he bought a, a house or, a yeah. land or something like that. <laughs> right. It was quite yeah. surprising to, yeah. to see yeah. that. 
Yeah, it is. It is. Uh, you know, I've, I've been fascinated with return mo- movements going all the way back to the Liberia days back in the 1800s. I've studied various African return movements, Ghana, uh, Tanzania, uh, African Americans in Ethiopia uh, over different times. You know, the interesting one about the contemporary thing is that, yes, you are witnessing African Americans, uh, mostly, you know, middle class and with means. Um, who are deciding that they really don't want to raise children, you know, in a racist society and want to live in a majority black nation. That's the interesting thing when it comes to African Americans going to Africa is that sometimes they don't even care about the government. It could be corrupt. It could be, uh, it's just like, but it's run by black folks. (laughs) And I just want to be around a majority black people. And so their motivations are a little bit different in returning and trying to go back because it's more about mental health healthy living and just not getting that caught up in the racial paranoias and all that stuff. Um, but then I've noticed another thing too, is that you have Africans who, you know, grew up in the diaspora, America, UK, who are returning back as well. Um, two different experiences, but two different moments that are creating two different kinds of tensions for the people that are there, right? When all of a sudden people with skills, we and a lot of people are coming with education and degrees, and that's a good thing. But you know, I do think that integration part of it, I think, is what's getting lost, right? Because it is creating job rivalry and competition. It is creating you know cultural uh, you know difficulties for some folks. You know, I think anytime if you're going to go back to Africa as an African American, you got to kind of make that effort to culturally, not necessarily assimilate, because that's really, I don't agree with that, but at least, you know, make an effort to culturally, you know, uh, integrate, whether it's, you know, making an effort to learn language, making an effort to understand cultural norms and behaviors and abide to those sort of things. Um, Because I've seen a lot of African Americans in Africa acting really American, and it bothers me. (laughs) It's like, you know what I mean? And and I think there's a responsibility um, because I'm I'm all for uh, return movement to going back, but I do think it does take conversation and and it's understanding what that means. You know, there's benefits to that and drawbacks um, and you don't want to create tensions with with people who are helping you, you know, like with Ghana's case, the government's case, they're saying, welcome back. They're really putting a lot of uh, uh, investment in this as far as with the Ministry of Tourism to do this whole like return tourism thing for African-Americans and people in the Caribbean and the diaspora. The problem is, is that there's nothing to sort of afterwards. So they've, yeah, you know, you can come and they loosen the immigration and they accept you, but then there's no sort of like what happens afterwards. And I think there is, there needs to be a little bit more process to that. You know, even in America, there's a kind of integration process for immigrants, uh, especially like in a refugee situation where it's like, you know, you get supported, you get training a little bit, and then you're kind of led on your own. But I think in this way, um, this is something that's very focused on uh, black elites. And I'm not saying that's a bad thing, but it's like people with means, education, multiple degrees, who are running to return back and and uh, are they doing it in a way that will make impact, you know? And that's the key thing um, is to make impact and make contribution if you're gonna be a returnee to Africa from the diaspora. Yeah, just a side note, uh, I once saw a video of Kanye West saying, oh, you know, black people should be buying land, you know, the, the, the phrase of uh, 40 acres and a mule uh, <laughs> promise. So black yeah. people should be buying land, and uh, I was almost screaming at my screen and say, "Yes, that's good, but you should also be buying land in Africa and be invested in Africa too, because you're buying land in the plantation. You know, America's uh, concept is the plantation. So yeah. you, when you're trying to make the case that you're free, you're not, uh, you don't have a slave mindset, like Kanye West always say. Well, mm-hmm. it's better to also reach out, extend outside the plantation, because America is is a plantation. Yes, there's yeah. no longer slavery, but quote unquote yeah. still a plantation. So yeah. reach out and invest, you know, uh, let's face it, we need investment, you know, in African yeah. countries because we can no longer yeah. rely on our government. We, we more likely rely on, you know, philanthropists, people that will, yeah. you know, build a factory, maybe easy factory in in Ghana, you right. know, wouldn't be mm-hmm. a bad idea, you know. So Yeah, 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 I understand. Yeah, totally. And and that's really and that's what I'm saying. This the issue is so complex. There's a discussion to be had around Pan-Africanism, the role of returnees, 
uh, when it comes to this notion of economic independence? What role can they play as owners, land ownership? The thing I'm saying is that we also need to be historically conscious, you know, and historically aware that, you know, past um, repatriation movements uh, have had a colonizing impulse to them. And we don't want to replicate that, right? You know, you know, you know what I'm saying? So it's like, yes, I agree, but also we can't repeat history and have a mass, you know, a mass African American return movement buying up land and factories and and mm. and you know, are we gonna have a Liberia situation again? Like, yeah. you know, like we don't want that, but we want something else around what black people can do with the wealth that they've been generating in America and supporting Africa. I'm only I'm interested in stuff that's just trying to go outside the box and not doing it in these philanthropic models, right? The NGO, I'm, I'm really influenced by Issa Shivji out of Tanzania. He wrote a fantastic book called The Curse of NGOism in Africa. And I recommend it to anybody. It's a very short book. And it's just really talking about NGOs have been in Africa for 40 years trying to bring water, right? <laughs> it's not working, right? <laughs> you know, like, so what is it about that these NGOs just repeat themselves and millions of dollars goes into them and they haven't, you know, really made enormous gains despite the sort of statistics that they present. And so he really gets into uh, how, you know, Western NGOism, NGO models, you know, are these models that really aren't advancing uh, uh, this uh, uh, struggle in any, uh, you know, particularly positive way. So I'm interested in people that are kind of thinking outside these box, you know, I'm thinking of, again, a lot of my references are Tanzania, there's this solar power movement happening. Um, and that's because of a, a businessman who has a very social equity and social justice perspective, talking about us, uh, energy, justice, uh, in the village communities that, you know, and he's starting with the community that he was from, but these are sort of the very interesting ways that, that I think um, Africa can be innovated, but I do think it has to break out of this NGOism. Uh, mm -hmm. All I've seen in NGOs when I go to, when I've been to Tanzania, which is a country that I've been to the most in Africa over the last 20 years, all I've seen is NGOs are the same people just moving from one NGO issue to another. So it's really about a largely Western, Global North based expatriates, majority white, um, but not just white, who come to Africa on three year terms to first uh, deal with building a well. After that term is up in three years, they stay in Africa because they really love it. Quality of life, cheap, you're living in a big house, you're all of a sudden moved up a few classes as an expatriate based on you know where you're from and the job you have. So they like the life, they have a few house girls maybe, you know what I mean? Like they got services, all these things that come with being an expatriate. And so their motivations are less about the issue and it becomes, how do I stay in Africa? Oh, I got a job with another NGO. We're working on girls' education, education for girls. They do that for three years, the contract's up. I still wanna stay, I've created a life, I maybe married somebody from Africa, I wanna, you know, so how do I stay on? Oh, I'm going with this other NGO. We're working on fill in the blank. You understand what I'm saying? And it's just this replication of replication. Only a few Africans get in, a select few get into this NGO thing. And it feeds them this model that's destroying the way they think about movement building. Yeah, I was saying that, you know, I don't want you to get me started because I have a lot of issues. <laughs> <laughs> I have a lot of issues with NGOs because, you know, for example, <laughs> you know, uh, during the Black Lives Matter um, protests and things like that, I wrote uh, an article about, you know, NGOs and, uh, you know, BBC here have uh, BBC Children in Need and it's like a Teleton where they raise money, they raise like 60 million pounds, mostly 100 million pounds. And half of the broadcast is, you know, uh, pe people in Africa, you know, sending someone to say, oh, this kid has been sleeping without a mosquito uh, net, you know. <coughs> and each year, they will send someone to go and send mosquito nets. Each year. So there's no really like an uptake. So it becomes a spectacle right. as far as I'm concerned. Right. And right, each, year, right. each year, they will put oil, oh, put water. And the water they are putting from this 60 million pounds raised is the mechanical water where you push Right. And not even a borehole right. that can disseminate water across right. community. Just, right. uh, you mm -hmm. know, so it becomes uh, right. redundant. I don't right. want to be ungrateful. I'm sure it benefits the people within mm -hmm. that community. But when you look at it critically, 
you say if you really want to help you know what i wrote an article is that if ngos really want to help what i really want is not really big beans you know i don't want your big beans i want lobbying active lobbying to right. you know uh balance uh, trade deals you know mm-hmm. most of uh, a lot of things toothpick gets imported in nigeria we import toothpick right. now right. can you imagine right. so and right. what we right. export is like two percent two point four percent you know, so right. so I want NGOs to start lobbying in terms of economic, uh, uh, you know, opportunity mm-hmm. for these African countries. You know, right. to level playing field and not uh, bag beans and mosquito nets. Right. You know, that right. is good as well. But the bigger issue that is it will make substantial uh, difference in people's life that will empower mm-hmm. them. You know, you want to empower right. people. You don't want to feed them right. bag beans from a spoon. Right. You know. Right. Exactly. Teach a man to fish, and he'll eat for a day. Right. Uh, uh, you know, give a man a fish and he'll eat for a day, teach him how to fish and he'll eat forever. The NGO is giving man a fish. So they have to keep coming back for the fish, but not giving them the fishing rod and the tools where they wouldn't have to be reliant on the NGO. Their model should be, we want to go in and build capacity amongst the people and the technical skills and the training that we can leave <laughs> and we and the people are empowered to build. Right, that's the way I look at it. But no, they want to keep giving the fish, yeah. not teaching African people how to fish. I, I, I'm, I, it's bizarre. You could do a whole comedy set about yeah. it. You know, giving giving kids, you know, laptops without in the rural villages without internet connection. Like, what is the point? You know, like you know these things. Like, where there's just like, are you thinking? Uh, they're not thinking about the root of the problem, and they're getting at something else. So it, it, yeah, it's it's a long list. Mm-hmm. And I think people are starting to question it more and more, at least in the last 10 years, because the movements that you're seeing, the pro-democracy movements that are emerging, are being generated from these NGOs, right? They're coming outside of, and then they're following along, right? Yeah. So yeah. it's not that they're init- initiating it. They're the ones that are like, yeah, I, oh, wow, these people are actually going out into the streets and yeah. trying to do stuff. Before, before I move on, uh, I just wanted to say that, you know, Obviously, I believe there's a three-pronged approach to this. Of course, we have to hold our leaders accountable. You know, I, I can't put all the blame on NGOs. You know, if they see a business model there, they can make money. You know, it's at the end of the day, it's a business. You know, the yeah. CEO gets paid, they, they mm-hmm. get revenues. So I don't really blame them entirely. You know, we have to hold our leaders accountable. We have to make sure we educate, you know, the young people, the youth, you know, to empower them. Inf- you know, knowledge is power. To empower them to hold people accountable, because most times you see videos coming out from most African countries, especially in Nigeria, where during election time there will be queue and the politicians will be given like people like you know five thousand naira a bag of rice, you know. And I used to be angry about that, but in hindsight, you know, I can understand if someone if that's the only way someone can eat at that time, you know, I, I can understand why they will take it, you know. So that's part of the education to mm-hmm. get to. S- Sa- make that sacrifice. You know, you talk about material taking or Malcolm commerce. Like, right. You know, there are people that can make sacrifices. You know, yeah. t- for overall good. But yeah, uh, yeah, I agree. And the education yeah. is big. You know, I think you know, there, you know, we have to rebuild up African uh, institutions of higher learning. You know, um, that, you know, we can't just keep relying. And, you know, you've heard the term brain drain, right? Yes. The African brain drain, right? Africa's best and brightest are all getting their education and their professional careers outside of Africa, you know, uh, and that's a shame, right? Um, Thinking about all of that intellectual social capital in the diaspora right now, if that was on the continent, you know? Um, So yeah, education, I I, 100% agree with you on that one. You know, when it comes to things around capitalism, I think it's a big question. You know, like, you know, I do think that Africa has been under the heel of capitalism and black people have been at, at the bottom. And yes, we have examples of 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 uh, African capitalists and diaspora capitalists using capitalism as a means to help others and things like that. But I think those stories are more on the minority when you think about the big picture and what's been happening to Africa as far as the exploitation economically because of its resources. Yes. So that one is a bigger conversation, um, you know, like totally bigger yes. conversation. I, I think Africa is just the, 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 you know, the crux of it all. It's at the center of the global world, given the ways in which it is being 
just drained of its resources by various global powers. So what's that? We can't talk about anything else in a lot of ways until we really get that under control and, and recognize that autonomy is important. Okay, I agree. Um, yeah, I was, know, I was wondering the the African and Caribbean activists, you know, the radicals, so to speak, uh, who pioneered the colonization. I was wondering if they mentioned reparation as part of the discussion then. Was there a discussion on that in those days? Wow, that's a really, really good question. I'm trying to rack my brain here about any discussion of, uh, you know, reparations. Because, you know, one of the biggest, one of the big things, while it might have been a discussion, it never really materialized. So I'm trying to think of, I can't think of any concrete examples other than you do know what happened right after independence, right? Is that African countries went immediately into debt. Yeah. All of a sudden they owed Europe for being colonized. Uh, <laughs> but I haven't seen, you know, in the debates around reparations, I haven't really been privy to or too knowledgeable about um this question when it comes to actually Africa, right? There's been debates around, you know, in the reparations debate, there's been this thing about does Africa owe a diaspora, for, you know, for reparations, for, you know, being complicit in the slave trade. That's been a discussion. I, you know, I'm not, I don't agree with that, but that's been part of it, but it's never been a separate discussion around colonization. You know, you think about, um, uh, it, I'm trying to think about some of the top, you know, theorists, uh, when you're thinking about Kwame Nkrumah's neocolonialism, you know, uh, last stage of imperialism, where he really, you know, coins the term neocolonialism, gets doubt into how it operates and the shell companies and all these sort of things and how they get access to Africa's resources for very, very low prices uh, and fees and how they use African governments to facilitate that through graft and corruption and all that sort of stuff, right? There's not one thing in there where he's really talking about Europe owes us. There really was a thing around, you just owe us our independence, like, you know, like, we need our, it was really national flag and nationalism. Um, it's a great question to think about, you know, because Africa did start, Africa independence did start in debt. They were already in debt at the beginning. So they're already behind. And now think about that for what Africa's been through from 60s, 60s, 70s and 80s with the IMF, World Bank and how um, um, debt has worked. Um, what you do know is that the way you see China maneuvering into Africa is by addressing that. They address that the U.S. model around debt will build you a road, but it'll just go, you'll go into debt. China's saying something different, right? We'll take your resources. If you have diamonds or this, you won't go into debt, but we'll have this trade partnership where we'll build you a highway and we can get access to your Colton or your Tanzanian or your, you know, uranium or whatever, right? They're doing a different set of deals than what the U.S. was doing, but it's still at a, at a, a deal that at the end of the day is talking about the exportation of Africa's resources and not using it to build infrastructure, build capacity. Um, so these are really, really big questions. So, I, you know, and, and, and I hope people in this podcast just try to understand that this is about conversation, right? Like to work through these very complex issues and you're really thinking about what pan-africanism means in 2021 2022 okay see i listened to your address at uh, tufts university symposium in honor of uh, martin luther king jr last year oh, wow. um, <laughs> yeah and um i was very very surprised because i never heard this before until you you mentioned it about uh, malcolm s visit to tanzania and I was wondering if you can elaborate on that connection, you know, uh, in those period, you know, you mentioned a lot of travel to other uh, yeah, parts sure, of Africa. Yeah. Yeah, can sure, you elaborate sure. on that, please? Yeah, yeah. And it's really fresh on my mind. I haven't, you know, revisited my book in a few years, but actually I'm currently teaching a, a, an advanced seminar on uh, Malcolm X. So we just kind of went through his Africa travels uh, a few weeks ago. So, um, but yeah, um, for people, you know, my book, um, uh, uh, Motorcycle on Hell's Run, uh, the first chapter is about Malcolm X in Tanzania, and that was intentional. Uh, while I look at the Black Power Movement in the U.S., uh, which is 1964 to 1974, um, I put Malcolm X in as the sort of progenitor of Black Power ideas. 
the stuff that he was saying in 1964 around Pan-Africanism, Black unity, fighting against neocolonialism, U.S. imperialism, connecting with Africa, uh, things like that, uh, which Malcolm X was saying during the last year of his life, um, based off of his travels and the connections that he was making, um, he uh, started to travel and try to connect, uh, make connections with um, different African governments and African leaders. And one place was Tanzania. And I found that out and wrote about the importance of Tanzania to his uh, Black liberation politics while, uh, while also tracing his activities uh, and what he was doing. So a few things, uh, I guess a few highlights. Uh, about Malcolm X. Tanzania, uh, one thing that I do argue is that Tanzania and the connections that he made there, particularly with a Zanzibari uh, political uh, government official by the name of Abdul Rahman Babu, who was part of the Zanzibar revolution in 1963. Then when the union between Tanganyika and Zanzibar happened in 1964, he was brought over into the union government because he was a really ardent Pan-Africanist he was a Marxist socialist, so uh, President Nereri had him work in cooperatives as well as working with African liberation movements in Tanzania. So Babu was Malcolm X's key contact. They met in Egypt during the Organization of, Afro of African Unity Conference in Egypt. Babu was really impressed with him, and it's Babu who ushered him into being able to actually deliver an address to the African heads of state. So it was through that connection with Babu. Uh, and so Babu invited him to Tanzania um, when they were in Cairo together and served as his host. And it was Babu who convinced President Nereri to meet with Malcolm X when he came to visit. Because initially Malcolm X was known as, you know, this devil, this, you know, I hate white people, you know, violent, you know, leader um, compared to Martin Luther King, you know, and if you look at President Nereri, President Nereri was a Catholic, believed in nonviolence. President Nereri was really like, I really want to connect with Martin Luther King and not Malcolm X. But it was Babu to be like, he's actually not that type of person. You really need to meet with him. So President Nereri said, oh, I'll meet with him with, for 10 minutes. And that turned into a three hour interview, uh, no, three hour conversation between Malcolm X and President Nereri behind closed doors. Completely changed how Nereri thought about Malcolm X thought about the black liberation struggle because uh, Malcolm gave him a different perspective uh, um, from, you know, um, the different from the civil rights perspective. So uh, Malcolm did other things there as well. He connected with uh, liberation movements that were headquartered in Dar es Salaam uh, in exile um, from Zimbabwe, uh, from Mozambique, Angola, South Africa, uh, and he connected with them. Uh, he, you know, met with Babu a number of different times. He met with Cuban officials. Uh, he really uh, linked up with the university, so uh, did interviews. Just really, you know, in the 10 days that he was there, uh, really created and, and uh, concretized his bonds with Babu and really saw Tanzania as an ally to the African-American freedom struggle. So once he returned back to the U.S., he started to incorporate more and more um, why Tanzania uh, was important for African-Americans to connect to. And so you see activists of a younger generation after Malcolm X is assassinated in 1965 start to take up uh, that call by going, by connecting to Tanzania, by being influenced by Tanzania uh, culturally, politically, um, and moving there and trying to um, help in the nation building project that Tanzania was doing. So I see Malcolm X as setting the groundwork setting the foundation for what other activists like Walter Rodney, Stokely Carmichael, um, people were trying to do bookstores, people trying to, you know, um, uh, do conferences, uh, people were trying to just uh, engage in various different elements of the Black liberation struggle, um, while also at the same time helping Tanzania. So they're trying to find a common platform. And Malcolm was the one who was expressing that. So by being welcomed by Tanzania, Tanzanians, he, he left with the sense that this was a, a, a strategic site of importance for the project that he was trying to do uh, in trying to create the organization of Afro-American unity. And he was actually trying to build a chapter in Tanzania because he saw that there was an African-American presence there. So Malcolm's time was really eventful um, and, and, um, and really important to what people were trying to do um, for the next 10 years between 1964 and 1974. Okay, so I know you are a Malcolm X guy. And sure. uh, uh, I was wondering, is it in terms of their approach or the fact that, like you said, you know, most of the uh, civil rights narrative has always been Martin Luther King dominated, right? You know, 
So mm-hmm. why do you uh, lean towards uh, Malcolm X more than Martin Luther King Jr.? Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't, you know, I've studied Malcolm X, yes, since I was like 12 years old. So yes, I've, I've, I've sealed that myself as a 30 year student of Malcolm X. So yes, he is my guy. Um, I think to say why I gravitated towards him and why I've continued to study him is because yes, I do think he's provided an alternative model once you particularly, you know, and even the self-defense model is important. Um, if you see what's happening in the United States now with the rise of um, far right groups being armed, um, uh, people being shot at protests, um, I do think Malcolm X has something interesting to say about African Americans' right to bear arms and exercise their Second Amendment rights. That might not apply for other people outside of America, but I do think Malcolm X has a lot of relevance for today. Um, but I think for me is that he really spoke to my experience. Um, I, you know, uh, Malcolm X is my guy because, uh, you know, I think something resonated with uh, when I was exposed to him as a teenager. And your teenage years are very important in terms of how they build you as an individual. So for me, he offers something that challenges a narrative that I think is important. The integration narrative, the civil rights narrative is important. But I do think there's been a, a systemic silencing of this other story. And that's the Malcolm X story. That's the Black nationalist story. That's the Pan-Africanist story. Um, so I do think that's why I've been so interested in recovering it, because it's not the stuff you see in the curriculum. It's not the stuff you see, you know, that people talk about. And when they do talk about it, they seem to have a misconception about it. Malcolm X hated white people. No, that's not true, right? Um, when he died, he believed in the redemption of white people. He didn't believe they were inherently evil. And were, you know what I mean? And, and the stuff that he got when he was in the Nation of Islam. Um, but uh, Malcolm had a very interesting platform very, based on very simple things. Travel. Go to other places and meet other people. It will broaden your perspective. Study, you know? So what he was doing was very simplistic and very relevant to how, to why he's useful. We don't have to think about him ideologically and be an ideological, you know, student, but more so about these very simple things that are, that stand the test of time. And and anybody who's interested in being an individual that is self-aware, globally conscious, Malcolm provides something that I think is useful there. Um, So that's why he's my guy. And, you know, there's a reason why they, you know, there's this, uh, you know, the way we remember King, Martin Luther King is even problematic to me. and that's because of a systemic way the government in the United States has thought to memorialize him and has thought to put him in the textbooks. And if you go to a, a civil rights museum in, in any state in the U.S. South, from North Carolina to Tennessee, uh, and I've been to them, is that they'll they'll just reduce the civil rights movement to Martin Luther King. And if you really knew about the civil rights movement, is that it was a grassroots people's movement of people from those communities and yes they saw king as a leader but he wasn't someone who was like did all these things and these that was that was done by the people who were there but now you have these museums that are just saying that you know king is responsible for this and to reduce it to just one man is is tragic and traumatizing yeah i have to say i watched the video of martin luther king making a very convincing argument on why he shows uh, non-violence and the uh, Obviously, the fact that you know black people are a very minor percentage of the population, they don't have the same uh, firepower with yeah. the U.S. government. So there are other right. aspects where it would be foolish, you know, according to right. him, to engage, you know, in a violent yeah. manner. And also, um, even though I like Malcolm X, I'm also thinking like uh, when I watch videos of uh, Martin Luther King, you know, those shots in Alabama. You know, he was saying he goes to those shows, and most people there are older, older than him, and yeah. he, he has that leadership qualities that they allow him to yes. lead. You know, which is yes. quite impressive that he was in his late twenties, in twenties, you know, when he started yeah. doing this. You know, which yeah, which it, was mind blowing. Yeah. yeah, Martin and Malcolm have a lot of similarities, and they can be studied um, for different leadership qualities that they possess. Uh, historically, though. <laughs> Martin Luther King, even though he was involved in a kind of coalition um, called the, um, what was it called? The ANLC, the American Negro 
Leadership Conference, which was a coalition of um, really, you know, moderate African American leaders in the civil rights struggle, and there, and this was a coalition around an Africa agenda. It's trying to set an Africa solidarity agenda, you know, but it never went anywhere. They didn't put it, you know what I mean? Like, and so with Martin Luther King, he really looked at his struggle in a very domestic way, even though he was influenced by Gandhi, he didn't have much to say about Africa. Malcolm X did. And that's where I think it's important. Malcolm X really invested in this question of connection, interconnection. And I don't think Martin Luther King focused on that as much, um, if at all, really. He did talk a lot about Ghana and his trip to Ghana, uh, but he did say to the younger generation of, of Black people in America who were fighting against racial inequality in the late 60s, that more radical generation of Black power activists, he did say to them, the whole international African solidarity agenda that you guys are doing is kind of like distracting and impractical. And, you know, I took offense to that when I was like, really, let me just look into this. And I feel like it wasn't based on the studies uh, that I conducted about Tanzania and what was accomplished um, in the type of bonds that were created. Yeah, I was saying before, I really have to talk to you a little bit about hip hop, you know, before. before oh, yeah, finish. sure. But no I, ju I just wanted to say that the, you know, uh, I always say you know, I draw make analogies with regards to when um, Jay Z and Kanye West is having like their issues, and Jay Z is a completely different person. Kanye West is, you know, more of a crazy character, and I yeah. make the argument that we need a Jay Z and we need a Kanye West. <laughs> it is it is very important to have. You know, uh, with all due respect to Kanye West, to so have a, a village idiot. I'm not calling him a village idiot, but you know what I'm trying to say? Someone that can be able to tell the emperor, you have no pants on, <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, sure. instead of being diplomatic. But you also need to have someone like Jay-Z that can sit down with the emperor and have a coffee and, you know, diplomatically find a way to, you know, negotiate with the emperor. So you, we need uh, someone like Kanye West and we need a Jay-Z and we need Malcolm X, and we need a Martin Luther King, you yeah, know, because sure. you have to appreciate. Like yeah, you do. They all, yeah, they all bring something to the table. Mm -hmm. And they, you know, I think we should appreciate that and not try to, you know, pigeonhole them into one box. You know, I think a lot, I think a lot of people today expect so much from celebrities, whether mm -hmm. it's a hip hop celebrity or not. And I don't know if that's fair um, or expect so much from an athlete you know, um, and expect them to like, know what's going on in Hong Kong. I, mean, I don't know about that. Like, that's not my expectation of LeBron James, you know what I mean? But somehow people expect him to be able to yeah. stand up for Hong Kong, you know, like, and it's like, really? So like, we have a lot that we're putting on celebrities, yeah. I just think is unfair, which I also think is dangerous. It's also reducing the struggle, right, to these yeah. things. So we gotta get a celebrity to speak on it, or we gotta do this, and, and people are getting these really bad models of what movement building is. We either gotta go into the street, or we gotta work on our TikTok game to the point where I get one million followers, and I'm a celebrity, <laughs> and then I can make change. Like, that's not, you know, what we need to do. Yeah. You know, Jay-Z is interesting to me. Jay-Z is interesting, not for his lyrical content of his music, I can name a whole bunch of hip hop artists who engage and are actually having conversations with Africa, right? And I can talk about African hip hop artists who are having conversations with African Americans mm -hmm. in a way that's really interesting and substantive. Substantive. And um, Jay Z is interesting in the model that he's doing as an artist who's reached celebrity status, black wealth generation, and cultural art ownership. You know, those things are really, really. Uh, you know, okay, I get it. You, you guys are, are flexing and using your platform. It's important, but it's not the only thing, you know, and there's nothing in his music for me that suggests any sort of, he's a lyricist. He can put words together in a very interesting way. He's a very talented artist, but as far as like message in the music, I don't see anything that's particularly appealing when it comes to things like Pan-Africanism, struggle, you know, he's now doing it now that he's in a position of power, but he's doing it really outside the music. You know, I was listening to the story of OJ the other day, and there's a lot of Malcolm X in that, um, that he's using, but there's a, you know, but that, you know, for me, like I see Jay-Z and I'm, I'm Hova. I'm Hova, I'm in a different way of like seeing him <laughs> as an artist. Seeing him as an artist and how we think about artistry and black excellence and how, what this does for image, because we are also facing this thing around image 
in the world. We have a globalized image of the, the globalization of African American culture is interesting to me, where we think about Kanye and we think about Jay Z in this way. When I'm trying to think about who's an African representative in the globalized world, and it's like I'm thinking more of like an Afrobeat. Yes. You know what I mean? So I'm like, you know, like, I, would like, I would like to talk who, to you. Who's the equivalent? Yeah, I would like to talk to you about uh, uh, hip hop in Africa, but I just wanted to say, uh, you know, when Jay Z did a music video where he featured a lot of black entrepreneurs, and one of the people he featured in that video is a farmer in Aberdeen here in Scotland. Mm. Oh, okay. And uh, the the it was the couple, you know, they blew up and you know media attention. They were holding interviews like on TV, like all the time, just for that, you know, few seconds of feature in that video. So I can see what he's trying to do, which you know, yeah. Uh, is, is but, but let me ask you, let me ask you this question. I'm gonna flip it on you now. I'm gonna okay. interview you, and you're gonna. But like, and I, and I and I did this in my class because. Um, I had them. So, have you seen Beyonce Return of the King, or you know Beyonce's like long music video? It's like an hour. Have you seen that? Uh, is it the one that has like a lot of Africans in the? Yes. The album? Yeah, we, we yes. Kid. Yes. Yes. So, is this appropriation or collaboration, right? And this is a happening within the African African diaspora discourse. Uh, I've I've read pieces by Africans saying like it's a is this a form of African American exploitation of Africa as the source of artistic inspiration right this regality this romanticizing that you see in that video um, Beyonce relying on a lot of like her whole image that make people love her is she has an African choreographer or an African designer um, there is this issue around. Um, established celebrities like Beyonce who are are doing a thing called scavenging African up and coming artists who haven't reached the Beyonce point you know you have these celebrity artists who are trying to stay fresh and take their material and their art and they might give them a platform but then they lose their rights and all these sort of things that go under a Beyonce and a a Jay-Z doing this stuff and because they're diaspora and they're using Africa as this place of inspiration, but really, you know, using African art, African upcoming artists, it becomes a really interesting conversation about Pan-Africanism. So do you feel like that was appropriation or is that like a good thing as far as like exposure, collaboration? No, I don't think it's appropriation, uh, one, because I consider, uh, you, you know, it's, you guys are called African-Americans. So it's Africans, you know, mm -hmm. they're in diaspora trying to uh, collaborate with other Africans. The only issue I have with it though is this started happening once Afrobeat started booming internationally. Whiskey mm -hmm. sells out O2 Arena before Beyonce mm -hmm. put him on the album. Right. So uh, so she's trying to take advantage of that right. uh, thing. So that's what I have issue with yeah. it, but I'm not sure if I'll call it a cultural appropriation in the sense yeah. that you know, other artists will use, uh, you know, Young Talk, you know, in order to mo get more relevant, sure. or they yeah. try to, you know, use uh, up and coming mm -hmm. artists to get more relevance, yeah. you know. So, yeah, yeah but yeah. I would have loved to see that earlier, maybe like five, mm -hmm. ten years ago, yeah. you know, when Whiskey is yeah. still uh, barefoot in Lagos in mm -hmm. first tag somewhere, you know, yeah. it would have been more, more meaningful. But yeah, yeah. Whiskey is already selling at O2 Arena, 50, you know, how many thousand people? Yeah, I know, right? You know what I mean? Yeah, it's true. So the African artists, the African American artists need them more than they need, you know what I mean, than the other way around. But I attended in 2007, I was in Tanzania for the year doing research. So living there, really immersed in the hip hop community there. But one thing happened is that Beyonce and Jay Z came to Tanzania for a, what's it called? Fresh water tour. So they gave a concert in Dar es Salaam, but then they also went up to a village and built a well. So it kind of comes back to this thing we're talking about. You're seeing a lot of hip hop artists, African-American hip hop artists falling in the trap of the NGO model saving. Uh, Talib Kweli came to Tanzania around animal preservation. I'm gonna do a little project. So it's great to see hip hop artists try to do this, but then there's this other thing where they are doing it in this one way and they're falling in the lines of like, let me give you something. Uh, I'll build a well or I'll build a maternity ward. And I'll also give a concert and performance, but it's also like, oh no, don't fall into that model. Can you artists all come together collectively 
and talk about instead of doing your own individual little philanthropic initiative, can you all come together under one foundation? Yes, yes, right. I, I agree. I wanted to say, ask you this question uh, because <laughs> can we truly achieve decolonization if we still have most of the post colonial? institutions in Africa, you know, was, <laughs> can we truly, because it's a very difficult, sometimes I think about this, you know, I'm speaking English, you know, I should be speaking Igbo now and have a translator mm -hmm. beside me, it would be more uh, complicated, yeah. but you know what I mean, we have the strip of the language and, you know, to some extent, some of our culture, so can we, is it possible to reverse this, you know, because that would mean draw, redrawing the map of Africa. That would mean, mm -hmm. you know, establishing a, yeah. maybe continental language, mm -hmm. maybe Swahili yeah. or some other language, or going yeah. back to our tribal languages. Mm -hmm. So yeah. how can we truly achieve decolonization? Well, I think, yeah, decolonization, again, a big question, <laughs> big question, complicated, big processes. But I think people should start understanding in this historical moment that we're in, we're seeing a few things that are revolutionary or or that are going to be causing uh, or that are on the precipice of huge historical shifts. One is the nation state model. Boundaries and borders are shrinking, right? People are migrating in ways, not only physically, but then in the information systems, people are representing having dual nationalities, all these things. So I think we've come at a point where one, things that we think are normal and have been around for so long, but historically speaking, we, we, are, we are in the democratic experiment, which is part of our modern world. And that's only a couple hundred years, you know what I mean, 500 years or so. But the nation state model is being tested. The democracy model as we know it, which has been inherited, you know, in Africa, uh, a democracy model, is being tested, even in the West, even in the global North, it's being tested. In America, democracy institutions are literally being tested now and we're on the pest of, of them, uh, like, are, are they gonna work? In the next 10 years, we'll know if they're really gonna work, right? Or there might just be, so I think people need to be open to the idea that these things are, that, you know, are never permanent just because of history and the facts of history, there are shifts, but I think we're living, the, the key question, is people being people being conscious of the fact that we're actually living in the moment now where those revolutionary shifts are happening, where in the next thirty years we might be talking about different models because some like because the nation state democratic Western model has gone away, like has disintegrated, and something else has reemerged. So I do think it's possible. The long way to reach your question because we're seeing it now. We're seeing people actually testing the boundaries of it and they're falling in Western nations. The people that have said, here's the model for you guys. It works. And now in the West, they're not working. They're crumbling. They're holding on by a thread. So I think once that happens and they crumble in the West, I think Africa and other people in the global South are gonna be like, okay, if it doesn't work in the place where it was founded, <laughs> then <laughs> why are we beholden to the model? And that's, I think that can be both exciting and scary. Okay. Exciting from a people's perspective, scary from like the power corruption perspective, you know what I mean? And yeah. people with power and what they do. Does that make sense to you? you know? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Makes sense. It's very, very complicated. Even I yeah. cannot really grasp it. So that's why I try to yeah. speak to people like you who yeah. have spent a lot of time, you know, yeah. looking into this. But, but see it, we're seeing it. We're seeing these things, these models being tested and you'll see, you know, I've read a few things around 35 years from now and, you know, and then you're talking about technology and what that means, you know, with this whole metaverse stuff and how people are going to be creating communities in different ways. You know, when I, when I write about hip hop in Africa from an academic perspective, particularly from Tanzania, what you're seeing with young people and you can not just Tanzania, but anybody who's doing hip hop outside of Africa, outside of the United States. Anybody who's engaged in this diaspora culture that has been globalized, exported, Africans have taken it, mixed it, done what they've done, taken ownership of it, but it's still hip hop. But that's still, I see that as an act of Pan-Africanism on part of the um, uh, Africans who are doing it in Africa. It's an act, you know, they're engaging with a diaspora art form. But then what they're also doing is saying that 
the ways that I'm identifying myself as a person, I'm getting it from other models and not just what the government's saying through the Ministry of National Culture, right, or youth culture that's trying to define what is to be um, a Nigerian or Tanzanian and what it is to be, say, a, a young person. What hip hop has shown is that you don't have to have those state models to define that and they're doing that on their own. The state may come on and co-opt it and say, oh, wow, this is how I get and reach young people or youth. Um, but that's what's being said is that, you know, national identity is being challenged, you know, and we're seeing that even with African writers. Um, if you look at the discussions between the first generation, like in Googies and the Chinua Chebes and other Soyinkas, is that what they're, and you're seeing it now with the new generation of Chibam, Chibamandas and others, is that they're writing it from a very diasporic perspective, you know, which is exploring this notion of what it means to be Nigeria, right? And it's not just in that, you know, and so I think that's where the future is going, where people are identifying less from their national national identity. Uh, the scary part with decolonizing and what you're seeing in Tanzania, and again, using hip hop as a lens with, um, Tanzania used to be the cutting edge of Kiswahili rap, right? Beautiful. First generation, uh, the 1990s, the early 2000s, you have some of the best Kiswahili rappers coming out of East Africa, Uganda, Kenya, Tanzania is the source for Kiswahili, what you could do with the language in a hip hop form. This new generation that we're seeing are now, there's more and more English being infused. There's more and more now, they're not even rhyming in Kiswahili anymore. And from their perspective, they see it, one is like, now we can communicate with others in the, because English is the language of hip hop, even though people can speak in French and stuff, but like it's still, now that we speak, it can rhyme in English, we can actually talk to our brothers and sisters in America, in England. And so they see that as a global advantage. But then from this larger perspective around culture and cultural survivals, Kiswahili is dying, dying with the younger generation. They don't want to learn Kiswahili. They want to be part of the globalized world and they're speaking English. So these are really interesting conversations to have about the benefits and drawbacks of that and what a truly decolonized world would look like, decolonization platform would look like from linguistic perspective when people are being multilingual and, you know, and doing other things too, like in Kenya mm -hmm. with Shang and the mixing in of all that language. You don't even get me started on Nigeria <laughs> and language and linguistics, right? <laughs> so, yeah, you know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So uh, I'm saying that as it's becoming evident, you know, you, you are an expert in, uh, in the study of global hip hop and I believe your current <laughs> research you know, centers around hip hop culture in Tanzania and Hartford. And, uh, you know, for people who don't know, you know, Hartford is a city in uh, Connecticut. Yeah. yeah. And I was wondering, is there a correlation there? Uh, why Tanzania and Hartford? Well, yeah, two different projects. Uh, um, so one is like, you know, like I said before earlier, you know, um, you know, you try to represent where you're from. That's a big hip hop philosophy that I embrace as someone who identifies culturally uh, with hip hop. Uh, and I also do it um, as a scholar and academic, as a teacher. Um, but there's this philosophy of like, you know, you want to represent where you're from. When I got to Hartford, um, you know, I, I, I'm from, you know, um, Boston and New York City are the two places I've lived at in the last 25, 30 years, right? Huge cities. And then Hartford is a very small city, um, very uh, uh, an immigrant city. Uh, we have people from Africa, mostly uh, Ghana, a uh, big immigrant community here. Uh, a lot of a very Latino city, Jamaicans, a big community here, and then Puerto Ricans, Dominicans. So one, it's a it's an immigrant city. Um, one thing about uh, Connecticut, the state that Hartford's in, is that it's one of the richest states in the United States, but it has the poorest cities. New Haven, where Yale is located, Hartford, where Trinity College is located, uh, Bridgeport, these are all under-resourced cities where you're talking about poverty, all the issues that even African cities are dealing with, you're dealing it, it, it you deal, you know, it's happening in Hartford. So Hartford is like a, a global South city in a lot of ways. The other thing that's really crazy about it is that the hip hop community and culture here is unbelievable. I've never imagined what I was gonna, you know, when I moved here to teach here, that they have a vibrant, sustainable community here. Um, graffiti culture. I mean, they have a, the mayor of Hartford has a Hartford hip, a, a Hartford history month that they celebrate in the city of Hartford, right? Uh, they have a, a, a free graffiti gallery 
where you can legally go there and do graffiti murals in the city of Hartford, right in the central city, where graffiti artists from all over the world come and do graffiti. There are dance battles, like it's, you know, Eight Mile, and they're battling, but dance battles in places all over the city. So the culture here is vibrant, sustainable, and has been here a really long time. So as someone who does stuff around hip hop, I was like, this is a perfect opportunity to get into public humanities. And so I've been working with someone on, uh, with the Hartford Public Library on a Hartford hip hop collection. We're trying to collect stories from people from the 1970s and 1980s who were helped create hip hop in this, in this city. And so um, my project is really about, is really doing oral history collection right now. So it can go into an archive for people of Connecticut, people in the city of Hartford to have access to and learn about the city from the perspective uh, and learning about the contributions of indigenous people um, and black and brown people um, who uh, came to and settled in Hartford and created this culture. So that's one thing I'm doing with Hartford. With Tanzania, uh, I'm doing something a little bit different. Um, I, I do write about it academically, but I'm actually currently working on a book that's more of a travel story. Um, I'm trying to write a non-academic book for a broader audience about my experiences as an African-American hip hop guy who's been encountering the Tanzania hip hop movement from 2003 to the present. So it's really a story of different stories of my encounters with the underground hip hop scene in Tanzania mostly. I'm mostly with the underground hip hop scene and not some of the people that, people that are like big time rappers and stars, but people who live hip hop, who look at it culturally, that might work and do something else, but they live hip hop. And I'm just kind of writing about my, uh, you know, what I've, what I've been exposed to, what I'm seeing, because as an African-American who's gone back to Tanzania, most scholars who've written about African hip hop are usually white scholars from the West. And they experience something different from someone who's African-American, <laughs> um, you know, who I've had a lot of access, you know, I've made a lot of friendships and bonds and um, it's given me insight into a movement, I think, in different ways. And so I really want to write about it in a more accessible way, in a more travel, in a more, in a tradition that's more around African-American travel writing about Africa. Richard Wright wrote a book about his travels in Ghana back in the 1950s. And there's been a whole tradition of travel writing about Africa that I've, uh, and, I, and so I want to write something about that, my encounters from an African-American perspective, hip hop perspective and, and, um, and yeah, and so that's what I'm doing next um, with the with Tanzania. So two different projects, but all, you know, under the umbrella of hip hop studies, global hip hop studies. Okay, I'm, I'm, I look forward to that. Um, yeah. You know, American culture is very powerful in terms of uh, its influence, you know, around the world. Yeah. And I would think that music and even movies in general, specifically from America, you know, plays a huge role in influencing like youth identity in, you know, yeah. in Africa. Sure. But I was wondering, to what extent do you think this happens? Oh, it's huge. I mean, there's there's no other way about it. And you see it in so many different ways um, where the danger is that what's being exported with American culture, right? And so I can, and I can talk from personal experience, not research. So again, personal experience from I mean, traveling to places. Yeah, so going to South Africa, you know, I was in South Africa, you know, um, and I'm just watching, you know, I did an Airbnb in Cape Town and I'm just, you know, chilling out in my apartment watching television. They had cable television. So I have cable television in Cape Town, South Africa, and it was all just the American reality TV shows. My 600 pound life, hoarders, and I'm like, oh, wow. Like, I didn't know this much of it gets exported. And it's pretty much all of that. And so to me, it's a huge issue. And um, because it, it sends a very lopsided picture about America, it sends this image around American dream. It sends this image that black people are successful, you know, um, when majority of black people in America are, you know, impoverished, you know, imprisoned, you know, where, but they export something like that. Uh, another anecdote, um, uh, I was on a bus, uh, in Tanzania and this, you know, random person, we started talking and then once he realized, you know, I wasn't a fluent speaker in Kiswahili, he goes, oh, you're African-American, you know, and he, I was like, yeah, yeah. And, and so the first question he asked me was, where's your bulletproof vest? And that was because that was during 50 Cent. That was during the reign of 50 Cent. And, you know, the person thought that, you know, African-Americans wear bulletproof vests 
two things I want to say about that. One is that, you know, there is this negative, you know, image that's being exported through the exportation of American culture about African Americans. But then it's also two ways. There's this negative image that's being ported about Africa to African Americans, you know, uh, in terms of what, you know, I know African Americans who don't believe that there are cities in Africa. And all of that is about knowledge and access. You can't blame people for being ignorant to a certain extent, you know, when you're giving, when you're uh, talking about people who are oppressed or marginalized. So one thing is that that miscommunication and misinformation is two ways, because we have lived in a globalized world where it's not just a one-way exportation, you know, Africa is being exported to, to America in a way that is very singular, you know, um, you know, Nigeria is a good example of, of, of a negative image where people will, you know, where, where the stereotype is Nigerians, we're going to hustle you and scam you. You know what I mean? Like, that's what you get, you know, when you know, you can speak to a diversity of Nigerians and what they represent. And it's not always the bad apples, right? But it seems like the bad apple image is being exported both ways yeah. <laughs> to each other, which is preventing that, come, you know, for us to see that we, you know, actually have more in common. I always tell my Scottish friends that, you know, whenever I'm interacting with, you know, people uh, here or anywhere in Europe, I'm conscious that I'm uh, the representative. I'm a Nigerian representative. Right. So whatever experience they have with me is not yeah. experience they have with Soshima. It's an experience they have right. with a Nigerian. Right. So th right. that impacts others. Right. right. So, so this is a burden that most of us carry that maybe you know, a Scottish person don't really carry that body. Because if I have an experience with a Scottish person and it was a bad experience, I would say, you know, I had a bad experience with James. Right. Not a bad experience with Scottish right. people. Exactly. You know? Exactly. Right. And that's the burden that's on us. It is a burden. We shouldn't have to try to be representatives of a, of an entire nation or a race of people. Um, but it is something that, you know, everybody kind of think goes through when they're like, oh man, if my encounter with this person might be the only encounter with an African-American, right? When I'm in Africa, I'm like, this is might be their only encounter with an African-American. It's important that, you know, they don't think I'm like a rapper or like a criminal, you know, like, or an athlete, because I'm none of those things, right? <laughs> you know, so, so it's good, yeah. But this is the stuff, those like, these are the things that I hope, you know, that, People and I think this is going to resonate too because I think a lot of people experience the same thing, um, whether the African American, Caribbean, um, or African, is that we uh, there are stereotypes about each group um, of people and that's always getting you know that's coming up against you know um, misinformation mm -hmm. uh, that we have to break down. We have to break down those walls and make sure that you know that the a more holistic picture um, is put forth. So I, um, you know, talking about influence, you know, uh, there's a, a, a Ghanaian drill rapper, you know, drill music in Ghana uh, called uh, Kawabanga. And okay. it, it sounds exactly like uh, pop smoke, you know, in terms of flow oh, it, yeah. and, and delivery, yeah, okay. you know, yeah. so it's like a drill rapper. So you see okay. that, the same influence we're talking about. And when I'm watching this, you know, my first reaction was like, wow, you know, I would like to see you know, um, more authentic stuff. But then again, I have yeah. to I have to challenge myself and yeah. say, well, is that really bad? You know, I don't yeah. know. Yeah. What do you think I about do think, it? yeah, yeah, I do. that's a great question. When studying hip hop in Africa or any place outside the United States, uh, you're gonna see sort of two different things with hip hop. You do have this trend of the more mainstream and a more mimicry based. I'm going to mimic the mannerisms and the style of a US rapper like Pop Smoke or 50 Cent or Jay-Z. Um, the mimicry, sometimes you see it, right? You see the mimicry and you're like, this is just performance. Yeah. <laughs> and, and other times I've met Africans where I'm like, this person's being authentic, like they really talk that way and they really are like, like they dress that way, but it's really in a way that's like original and it's the style. So I think it is like, it's not just one thing. There is a mimicry element to it. I do see an African hip hop or specifically like Tanzanian hip hop youth or youth that are into Tanzanian hip hop that they're just straight mimicry like, and that's just trying to sound African-American or, you know, using the N word, things like that, where it's like they have no context and it's just, you don't know even know what that word, you know, means or, or, you know, things like that. So, but I've met other Tanzanians 
in my travels, in my encounters, who are very conscious of trying to be more original. What can I take from African American hip hop culture and influence and bleed it with and connect it to my culture? You know what I mean? And so I think you're gonna find two different streams of thought there. You do see the mimicry a lot though. And I think that's the first thing that people see is the people just, wow, you're just trying to act like Jay-Z. And then if you, you know, I think it, there's this other element there too of people who have been able to fuse it together in a way that keeps it authentic and local. You yeah. know, you mentioned the N word, which is something that is uh, very I uh, find interesting because, you know, growing up, it was never in my vocabulary, you know, and I, <clears throat> even up to now, I don't use N word, not out of uh, moral superiority or anything of that nature. I actually sure. defend, I actually defend the use of N word by, mm -hmm. you know, African Americans because the way mm -hmm. the word has been turned to, to, you know, disarm the word is actually a good thing and the poetic. Uh, nature mm -hmm. of it. I always defend that, but I don't use it personally Agreed. because it was never in my vocabulary. So I feel uh, inauthentic starting right. to use it <laughs> now. So, but I've seen that a lot in Africa now, where people use it yeah. in their everyday <laughs> language. Yeah, yeah, and yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I agree with you too. I, I'm not one of these anti N word users. Um, I use it in my classroom in the text that we read. You know, I, I, I go up against students who try, you know, like this whole sort of what's happening in academia in the US with language and not being able to say words and things like that. I'm on the side of, you, you know, it's been disarmed. It, it's been infused with different meaning um, depending on context. Um, uh, I think people should be responsible when they use it though. I do think rappers do have a responsibility uh, in a lot of ways because they've thrown it out there so much. It, it is weird to see like a rapper in Europe and a crowd of white people saying the n-word to a song that's for me is jarring and uncomfortable um and so uh but but overall i'm not against the sort of banning people from saying it and understanding that uh, part of african-american culture has been uh resistance through language and taking words that were used to denigrate and oppress and flipping them so um but it is this thing now where i you know we're seeing a new generation the woke generation, if you will, who are starting to challenge even that, you know, because I come from a generation where, you know, it's a little bit different on how we use that word and not being so offended by it. Yeah, While so now, we, people be are really, really offended by it, <laughs> banning it in the classroom, even if it's written in a text by yeah. James Baldwin. And wow. so just be like, you can't say that, you can't use that. And so I'm, 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 I'm on the fence too, as a scholar who re who values academic freedom. Yes. And as someone who also values freedom of expression when it comes to art, that I think these discussions around the N-word use are getting really extreme, you know? Yeah, yes. So I wonder- But if you feel uncomfortable saying it, then that probably means you should be saying it, you know what I mean? Even in a, <laughs> even if you're with like another person and it's like brotherly, and if you're not used to saying it, because again, it's a culturally ingrained thing where people have been using it for yeah. a long time since they were a kid, you know? Uh, but I remember telling somebody once when someone said, Professor Markle, do you use the, you know, have you, do you use the N word in like, you know, you know, outside of academia when you're talking with friends or listening to hip hop music? And I was like, well, I use it selectively if I'm with like a friend of mine right close friend of mine we've used it all the time for a long time where it's very natural and organic when we use it and we know what it means when we say it um but um but the issue i have is i have an issue with the older generation people that are older than me so people in their 60s and 70s who are yelling at us and i'm like you called me that word the other day when i talked to you on the <laughs> phone about something <laughs> So it's like, yeah. it's, it's intergenerational and I don't like the whole generation blaming on the other. Oh, this generation is using this word so much. Like it's been yeah. used so long by each generation in African-American history that this whole generational blaming, it's not true. It's just, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's funny no, in, in terms of uh, African-American culture, I completely understand that. And I completely, you know, uh, not encourage it, but I completely understand why it's been infused into the culture. But in terms of Africans in Africa, 
You know, it was yeah. never something that never you, something there you, that was in that vocabulary. Yeah. So yeah. It's, I find it inorganic. Yeah. Uh, yeah. For me personally, yeah. to to use it. And, I, and I've taken, like you said, about representation. Every situation I've been in in Africa, particularly when I'm circulating in hip hop circles, where the terms used a lot. Uh, and I'm talking about in Africa by Africans. Uh, you know, I remember in Ghana. Um, you know, in the, in the late '90s, uh, I was hanging out with a lot of hip hoppers there, and, and the first thing they said to us because I was with some other African-Americans who were uh, studying abroad and they were like, what's up my, you know, what's up my N word? And I was like, whoa, because <laughs> that was my first time in Africa. I didn't expect to be returning to the motherland to be called the N word, you know what I mean? By my brothers, you know, so I was in that mode, like what, what's going on? Um, you know, after, you know, being around, you know, I understood why they were saying it. They're saying it in the camaraderie brotherhood sense. But at the same time, too, that hasn't stopped me from talking to someone being like, do you know, like the origins of that word, you know, and the history behind it? And I might take a second and do a little history lesson just to be like, just so you know, if you don't know, you know. Yeah, that, that makes sense. I just wanted to end on this because uh, one of my favorite musicians uh, in Africa, not just in Africa, for time is uh, Fela and Nicola Pocuti. I don't know if yes. you've heard about Fela. Of course. So it's someone that uses his music as a you know creative response to you know uh, government oppression and he's yeah, an sure. activist. Even the mom mm-hmm. uh, is, is an activist as well. So he thinks about you know social issues. He thinks about he thinks about uh, you know he has sang about United Nations, Beast of No Nation. Yeah. You know one mm-hmm. of his songs. So, but uh, the evolution of African music now has gone to the point where it's all uh, less conscious. Yeah, what's the message of the music? Yes, yes. So, Mm -hmm. and uh, I really don't want to say is is is, uh, blame America for that, but I don't know exactly (laughs) where the transition happened. You know, do you have any thoughts on that? I wonder, you know, uh, obviously we don't want to be general, exactly. you know, each, uh, each situation in Africa is different based on their political economic, because, you know, but we do have a, a positive example, right? Senegal, Yenanmar movement, that was hip hop that prevented Wade from a third term, right? He tried to do a third term, tried to change the constitution, Yenanmar hip hop group, but a larger hip hop based movement prevented that from happening. So there are models out there of kind of contemporary conscious hip hop that actually did radical social change, prevented a dictatorship, right? Um, But as far as like the delusion, you know, the same thing I would say uh, is happening to American rap. It's then depoliticized and it happened at a certain point in time when it started to start making a lot of money when it became and when the powers that be realized that this was a multi-billion dollar industry and, you know, these things happen with privatization and gatekeepers. Um, I think technology opened that up with MySpace and then all these other platforms for independent artists. But, you know, I think something happened with that where there was this thing that happened in the mid nineties with privatization in Africa, neoliberalization, and exporting of American culture, and then it being so powerful. MTV is powerful, you know, like on youth and young people, <laughs> like let's not be real, you know, like it's very powerful and influencing. And they just got a, a very depoliticized version of hip hop that they modeled on, you know? They didn't get a public enemy, like you know, my generation, where we were like public enemy was on MTV, it was pop culture. Right, you're not getting that. You're not getting a political group that's like pop culture. That's like a Drake, who are where their their songs are always going to have a conscious element to it. Yeah. You might find you might find contemporary big artists like Drake or Kanye, Big Crit. You know, other other big artists might have a song that's political on the album, but it's not something that they're advertising and marketing to such a huge extent. But then you see the song, and it's called like the new Malcolm X. I was like, wow, this guy did a whole song on Malcolm mm-hmm. X. Polo G? Like, who's Polo G? Like, I thought he was like a Southern gangster rapper. You know what I mean? Like, so it's like, I think part of it is like institutions and forces understanding that hip hop is powerful as a voice of change, as a voice of, as a a tool of empowerment. Like, you know, you know, people see that and they see like, wow, you know, and, and they do make moves to try to prevent 
um, young people especially from being politicized. And unfortunately, hip hop has had on the one hand has been a pool of has been a tool of political politicalization, and has also been a tool of depoliticalization. I see two forms of hip hop that has been exported, or uh, the people that uh, the hip hoppers in Africa that I find are really conscious is that they've made a more um, proactive choice in, f in getting access to the music that isn't the stuff that you see in the top billboard charts. So they'll reach out. So, I, so there's a story in Tanzania about, because uh, I asked this very specific question because I started meeting Tanzanians um, my age who were like pioneers in the 90s who could have these, we could have these, and who've never been, never lived in America. It wasn't like, oh, I lived in America for 10 years. It was more like, I'm born and raised. I've never left Tanzania. They were like, we could have really philosophical conversations about a Gangstar album. And Gangstar is a really underground hip hop group from New York producing these really dope albums in the 90s. And here's someone being like, oh yeah, let's talk about Hard to Earn. I really like the beat. I'm like, what? wait, 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 wait. That made me step back and start to ask really specific questions about how did you get access to this stuff? And the stories that I got were, we were very proactive. We, we would find out like cousins and family members who were in the United States and be like, get me these specific things. Not just like bring back hip hop. It was more like bring back Public Enemies, Fear of a Black Planet album, bring back the Source Magazine, Rap Pages. They just were knowledgeable and got and figured out ways to get this stuff. And that's how they were kind of got a different side of the more positive underground hip hop principles and values that they have started to implement and use to create a different type of hip hop movement that is more around social justice and empowerment. While the ones that aren't that proactive in their consumption of US hip hop just might get the Kanye strikes and think that it's all about, you know, <laughs> the high life, right? And it's not like, so there's something about these hip hop artists and that's in every country, not just Tanzania. I met cats like that in Ghana who were like super into Wu-Tang Clan. They would throw Wu-Tang parties and play all of their songs on all of their albums individually and do this party. And this was in the slums of Accra. This was in, um, you know, VIP, Visions in Progress. No. Have you heard of them? So no. VIP, Visions in Progress is a big Ghanaian hip hop group. But when I met them, they were just a bunch of young kids in the slums of Medina, Muslims who were now they are award winning Africa award, hip hop awards. But in the late nineties, they were just a crew of kids from the slums of Medina. Wow. Know? We linked up with them because we were hip hoppers and just hanging out, but they were throwing Wu-Tang block parties in the slums of Medina. All they had were just the CDs of all the Wu-Tang clan and speakers and people were out in the streets. And so we're like, this is a different type of consumption. You know what I mean? And so that's what's important is that Africans have figured out interesting strategies on what they want to consume. They're selective consumers. It isn't just being fed to them and they're being like, ah. They're actually, there is set, another set of Africans on the continent who are very strategic and conscious and proactive in how they consume US American culture. Okay. Hey Seth, can you get me that Malcolm X biography? I had a Tanzanian ask me about the new biography that came out on Malcolm X, being like, hey, when you come to town, can you bring that? <laughs> you know what I mean? Wow. Like, so, now I'm, so now I'm an asset too, right? Mm -hmm. I'm part of now the network and mapping that they use to be like, hey, and it's not just most Tanzanians or most Africans that I know ask me to bring back a pair of Jordans or fashion, but they're also asking me to bring back like, could you bring back like this particular album, very underground, hard to get, or a record or something like that. So consumption, I learned that consumption isn't just forced in one way, that Africans also have taken these enormous steps to consume very specific American products. Wow, that's, uh, that's really uh, yeah. promising. That's, that's good to yeah. hear. So I want to ask you, what advice, you know, to end here, what advice would you give um, Africans in diaspora? on the best ways to uh, engage in Pan-Africanism or support and facilitate some elements of decolonization, uh, how best to engage in Pan-Africanism? Yeah, I think for, you know, one is, you know, is a combination of having these type of conversations, whether informal or formal, um, 
you meet somebody who's different from you, a part of the black diaspora and all these sort of things. We, we get so focused on just our, our lives and I gotta go here and not taking the time to get to know people. Uh, and these situations arise all the time, of uh, random moments for encounters, but take advantage of those, be mindful of those encounters, uh, of meeting different people and having these type of conversations. Because I feel like this conversation we've had, I've had with people all the time who are not academics, right? Or not intellectuals, but are like, we can still talk about, does Beyonce, does Beyonce really romanticize Africa here? Like in these sort of things, isn't that dangerous because it's presenting Africa in a really romanticized image when there's a lot of struggle that needs to happen. And now she's presenting a very regal, and, you know, beaches and, you know, so these are conversations that happen all the time. Um, and then this other thing too, um, you know, uh, again, going back to the model, even though we're living in a very difficult pandemic times and things, you know, I do believe in travel in going places. And yes, we can travel via the internet and via Zoom and all these sort of things, but it, you ask anybody who has traveled to places, there's a whole different experience and different element of connection that you could be, make with people through travel. So um, once we get all that situated with the pandemic and all that, I, I do really wanna urge people to, to do those things because it does broaden your perspective and that's what needs to happen in the type of world that we're living in. Um, and then I guess the third thing is mental health and mental awareness. Mental health, uh, you know, I think this is becoming an issue. Uh, we talked about this earlier about trauma, the historical traumas, traumas of the past, trauma that comes with language, the N-word, trauma that comes with this idea around slavery and how this, you know, all of a sudden we have documentaries and films now, they're really violent and it's becoming, uh, you know, but I really, uh, in my role, even as a teacher, uh, teaching black students uh, at a college that I work at and dealing with a lot of, you know, students dealing with the mental health issues. Uh, black students dealing with mental health issues. Uh, and these students are, and again, black students I deal with who are African, Caribbean, African-American, you know, um, that are at the institution that I teach at. Um, and so we have to come up with ways around thinking about our mental well-being, our, our health, um, because we are consuming and absorbing all of this violence. And it might not be physically, um, but it is what we're seeing, you know, watching George Floyd get, you know, murdered on tape that's traumatizing it's traumatizing to look at and experience and so mental health and taking care of our mental health uh, is important whether people do that through spirituality through religion you know um, or through uh, non-religious means uh, we have to emphasize it um, because this is the thing that will lead to burnout exhaustion sickness uh, and you need people to make change Okay, um, Professor said, Marco, thank you very much for coming on the show. Thank you very much for your time. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much.